Same as your neighbor's? I don't know if I can make no way. Recording in progress. later on if you want it is live on youtube if you want to do that uh i'm tired of being a television studio host i am a teacher for civil engineering so that's what we do for the rest of this hour um we've posted a problem on here to see if you know how to do these uh, bearings and these uh, distances and the first thing you should do is to make a a drawing you should make a sketch relative to the point. <clears throat> so I kind of arbitrarily pick an A on the piece of paper somewhere. And relative to A then, which is at 4,300, B is at 1,750 north. So we've got a north and a south and an east and a west diagram relevancy and the more into statics you get the more you screw this up so we gotta be alert to this this is at 4300 this is only at 1750 so it's down here somewhere i don't know where but it's down somewhere this is at 2600 relative to that easting is at a greater number of 3900 it's over here somewhere so b kind of gets sketched on about like that. Moot on entry. So relative to this, we've got these components. So in order to go from A to B, you're going to have to go south which we call delta north, the change in the north, you're going to be a negative, don't worry about it a ton. Mostly, if you've got a picture, you have to worry less about plus and minus. And to go from, um, from A, you have to go more east to get to B, or the change in easting. So if I take those numbers, I take 4,300, subtract 1,750, And 
and if I'm somewhat careful, this is 25.50. I have to go south 25.50 meters, feet, whatever the units happen to be. We'll assume the, the units to be in feet pretty much all the time, kind of my default value. <clears throat> And then to go from A to B in an easterly direction, we're going 2,600. I would probably subtract it from 39. I just like to do that, subtract a little the big. 3,900 minus 2,600 looks like 1,300 this way. Most of the time students get that part right. Um, the ones who think that it's too cold and wet to come up in class sometimes they <coughs> miss this part because they try to solve for this angle over here and that's wrong. That's not the angle we want. That is not the bearing angle. This is the bearing angle that we are looking for. That is the bearing angle. <clears throat> you may have been told for 20 years to solve this angle. I'm telling you that that's going to get you a <coughs> A reduction in points on this test question. Got to solve for this bearing angle. And this is our distance from A to B, sometimes called the resultant. You want to call it the vector terms. So let's do the let's do the magnitude, the distance first. That's the easier one. Again, most students get this one right. It's simply the square of the, the square root of the squares. <coughs> And I get 2862.25. I kind of use the rule of George and give me two decimal places. I know I didn't hear. I know that's not a significant digit. I know all that stuff that you know. I'm just saying that in general, you will have two decimal places of precision to work to. Um, and I don't care if you round it there or you don't. I would prefer you to give me the two decimal places than to not. Okay. Don't show me what you think you know. Just do what I think. Put two decimal places down. Works better. Um, now the angle is a little more problematic because we've got to think so Catella, sine cosine tangent. Tangent of this angle, tangent of this angle is opposite over adjacent. The tangent of the angle we are looking for is opposite <coughs> over adjacent. So the tangent of that bearing angle is uh, 1300 over 2550. Now here's where I would not screw around with those negatives. You'll get negative answers and all kinds of stuff. Don't worry about it. Just take absolute value. It's fine. It'll work. So in order to solve for that bearing angle, we take the inverse tangent, the second function of that 1300 over 2550. Shift tangent. And you're going to get a decimal number. Okay, you're going to get a decimal number because that's how calculators work. They like decimals. We don't use decimals in civil engineering. Construction angles, turned angles, laid out angles, bearings, none of that. We use degrees, minutes, and seconds. So you've got to convert that to DMS. Again, point reduction if you don't on the test. So second DMS, 27 degrees, no minutes, and 46 seconds for the angle. Still not the answer. That's the, that's the angle, but I need the bearing. And bearings have north, south, east, and west associated with them. So in order to go from A to B, I have to go south and east. I have to go south and east to get there. So now you have a bearing and you have a distance and you have the full 10 points or whatever that thing is going to be worth. 
Yes. If I put southeast just on the right side, I'll laugh at you. I guess that's still. Yeah, I probably would. But now that we've had this conversation, you'll never do that again the rest of your life anyway, right? So we, we work through it. You just don't want to mess up the left. You know, e on the right. You can turn the light here. <laughs> <right. laughs> what want my people at home to miss out on their French toast. Me. Okay, that was a good question. Any other questions on that? So you got to be able to do that. Yes. Is it important with regards to position that we have two zeros and one? Um, that's a good question. <clears throat> I will tell you, uh, in, in, instead of precision. Think of it as just always giving me DMS. And since there's no minutes, the zeros should just be in there as placeholders. It's just kind of a thing. Uh, likewise, if I had south uh, four degrees, I would often do that. Four degrees, one minute, and three seconds, I might put in the zeros just to give me placeholders. It's more of a visual thing than a correctness thing. That's a good question. <clears throat> you don't need yeah, another question. Sure. So, turn that like the degrees per second, is that just using the angle? That's just like the distance. Say yeah, that again. Okay. So, when you're calculating degrees per second, do you need like the distance, or is that just the angle? Like what it shows? This? Yeah. When you, when you calculate it and you hit the correct button on your calculator, it should take this decimal degree and convert it back. So the I guess my short answer is always just carry your decimals and convert it and leave it in DM all the degrees, minutes, and seconds. Like I said, from a precision standpoint, I understand this, you know, the way I have it written was to the nearest 10 feet. Okay. 10 feet is not going to get you seconds of precision. They're not, that's not comparable. 10 feet is like a minute or so, probably in the degree range almost. So you know, technically, here. Now it's degrees, minutes, and seconds. It matches your distance precision. Like it's good. We got a little bit more to learn about that. It's called precision ratio. When we actually do some measurements, if we ever get to go outside measure, um, it'll it'll be a little bit more clear to you. But typically, we're working about this much, and usually about probably five or ten seconds in in reality. Um, that's about the precision of the equipment, it's about the precision of our distance. When we hit a button with a measurement on it, it's going to be the two decimal places. Um, we're all fooling ourselves if we think we're measuring closer than our thumbnail, but we are measuring closer than 10 feet by a whole lot, closer than a foot, probably closer than an inch or a tenth, somewhere down into the hundreds range is where we want to be, which is generally going to be in the second range. Now, of course, the farther the seconds are out, the more that pretends out, the more that, that gets widened out. So there's some practical limit of a few hundred feet that you're working into. Um, we'll, we'll get to that particular question. Anything else? All right. Um, second thing. Second thing. I don't know how this is going to work doing this, but I'm going to try. Um, Know if I can minimize this or not. I think I can. Before you do the things, okay. I got work. All right. Second thing then is I want to teach um, for today about a topic. A little different than what we've been doing. It's called zoning. It's like a like a change of mindset here. We're kind of out of math world. We're kind of out of measurement world. Uh, we're in the, the civil engineering world where we have uh, have some design aspects of what we do. <clears throat> So in the design world, 
which is where we're going to kind of start in our lab today. Uh, we're going to start to put a restaurant on the site. Now, again, we're, we're working in reverse order a little bit, not greatly, but a little bit in reverse order because typically we would have run control. We would have done some measurements to find out what the topography is. We would have located some manholes and storm sewers and uh, trees and stone hands. We would have done some of those early mapping exercises before we handed the surveyors, um, handed off to the civil engineers uh, to do their design. And it's sometimes simultaneous with the architects. So in other words, sometimes the, uh, the owner would say, architect, I would like to have this building here. And the architect would begin to draft out some elevations, maybe a rough plan, a uh, floor plan, etc. Sometimes they're prototypes where, you know, like if it's a constant restaurant, like the Panda Express is probably the same everyone uh, across the United States. A lot of times uh, you'll have just what's called a prototype. They'll just have a packaged, here's what the footprint, here's what the building is. You know, Bob Evans, they're like all the same. Yeah, maybe the inside they might left right them or something, but by and large, the footprint of the building is the same, uh, et cetera. So <clears throat> that those can or cannot change. We're just going to pick a square or maybe that's the rectangle uh, because this is an architecture school. This isn't the AE program where they would get into that kind of work. We're just doing footprint and outside site work. So our stuff is pretty much all the design of the site and nothing to do, or very little, very, very little to do with the building. We might pick a front door. We might pick a, you know, if we're going to have a patio or a side door. But beyond that, we don't get to do none of those fun things that the architects or the AEs um, would do. So this takes us to this topic called zoning. Zoning. Um, is, a, is a rules and regulations. It's kind of like a building permit-ish thing. Uh, it's a government agency. Um, the government agency has been developed over the last, I don't know, probably not quite 100 years, probably 70 years or so. And it came out in, in the 50s, primarily in urban areas, to try to control the character of the neighborhoods. So perhaps the city, well, not perhaps, the city of Cincinnati has a zoning department. And it's developed over the many years. In the early days, um, you know, Cincinnati was coming into existence. There would be lots in downtown, and you could put on a house, you could put on a store, you could put on a factory, a warehouse, um, you could have a slaughterhouse, you could have whatever you want. And there was some understanding that uh, philosophically people that own property were allowed to do whatever they wanted on it. And that worked pretty good for many, many years. But as time kind of developed, sometimes the slaughterhouses were pretty nasty next to, you know, the, the row houses or the apartment buildings. And there was some kind of cry out for some control of what could be built where for the good of the community. And in a, particularly in around the 50s, after World War II especially, um, there was a large surge in development and building in the United States, pretty much everywhere. Cincinnati was no different. And about the same time, you know, the returning soldiers and the fact that they won the war and all that kind of good positive stuff, people were getting rich or richer or starting to have some uh, influence. They would have an automobile. They might have, uh, you know, the ability to buy a car. They would have the ability to buy a home, a small home, instead of living in a farm or something that would come into the city uh, and start to do some of those kinds of things. Well, development started to take off and there was some real um, hodgepodge of stuff going on. And in order to sort of control that, how big the sites were, well, how about if I have a house that's on a 20 by 25 lot, just as big as a house? Well, those are kind of downtown-ish, real urban areas, you know, very, very small lots. Um, but that didn't work so much for the suburbs. The suburbs, they want something with a little bit of grass and something to mow their lawn, a fenced-in backyard to keep the dog and all that kind of stuff. Um, you'd have, well, we need to go shopping. I live in the suburbs. Well, little corner stores didn't cut it anymore. Uh, we need, we've got a lot of people, surge of people. The, you know, the baby boomers were coming, coming out pretty quick, and 
people were starting families and they needed to have a store. So let's put up a store. So Kroger started to get bigger. You know, they instead of having a little corner store, Barney Kroger, now you had something that was, you know, maybe 300 by 300 square. And like, oh, this is a grocery store. Now we laugh at something that small. So they started to develop things like malls, shopping malls, and shopping centers, and you know, take 40 acres, and we have every store we can possibly think of in here, and everybody can just come here and shop, and the bus route would come in. All of that stuff started to rock and roll. Um, there was uh, you know, industrial areas. People had to get a job, so there's a lot of industrial stuff going on. Well, you don't want to have an industrial community next to the apartment buildings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, uh, what is it, Whitman Woods area, not Whitman Woods. Um, Fort, uh, Forest Park it was one of the first uh, communities that was what they call a planned community, where you had the, kind of the streets were laid out and the lots were nice, but they had a nice connector road right over to General Electric where they could you know, go to work and all of that kind of stuff. So this whole concept of planning and planned development really started to take off. Um, in, in the 50s, and the zoning was the word, I don't know what it means exactly, but zoning was the word that came into existence as the government agency that would control that. Now, each community gets their own say. Each community gets their own say. What's a community? City of Cincinnati, well, they get, the city of Cincinnati has a zoning code, but even the neighborhoods get to have a say in what they want or what the, you know, the residents there think is proper for an area. But it has to be codified, has to be in code form, has to be passed by you know, people who are elected so that it has some validity to it, so it can be enforced. So there's a zoning code, and each area then would have sort of its own zoning. They would say what would be allowed. <clears throat> Sometimes in Hamilton County, the unincorporated part, some of the townships wanted their own. So they don't, they're not a city, but you know, Green Township, Colerain Township, if you were here from around here or Sometimes your own uh, township in your own county, perhaps wherever you're from, they would have their uh, they would have a board in the zone, and they would say that this area is such and such. Occasionally, the residents would vote whether they wanted a particular zone or not. Um, Hamilton County, Whitewater Township. If you're from around here, if you go west across the 74 and the 275 area. Um, there's a there's a township called Whitewater Township. Their vote, uh, their residents voted a number of years ago to not have any zoning. We don't want government interference. We don't want some government tell us what to do. <clears throat> I get it. I understand. It, I even agree with it. However, as, as you drive out State Route 128, you've got the little stores in Miami Town, and then you come out, and there was uh, there's a gravel pit that's going in, or a gravel uh, place that sells gravel, and then there's a an apartment building, there's three houses, and there's a, a storage facility, and then there's something else that's just gone in. It, it struck me the other day when I drove by, it's like, this is kind of weird. Um, some sort of a factory, and then, you know, a park, and then, and, okay? Some people like chaos, I love it. I, I can thrive on the chaos. Some people hate that, you know, I, I bought this $200,000 house, and now the guy next to me gets put in a pig farm. You know, is that right or wrong? I don't know. It's a, that's what zoning does. It kind of uh, controls that. And depending upon your, uh, your take on the matter, you get to pick that. Okay, so through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s opinion, George thinks that the zoning people get to be too heavy-handed. Now you've got not the community and the residents voting on what goes in, You've got three or four people who are appointed as the director of zoning from, from the county commissioners, and, and they get hired on as the zoning administrators. Yeah, there's processes and such and such, but it's like this guy gets to tell everybody else what to do in that community. So an opinion is that the zoning people, um, agencies, government agencies, got to be too much. They would start to dictate, man, you can only have, and I'm telling you the truth, one of the communities that I lived in, um, there was a zoning rule that mandated the owner of the house um, bring before the board the color of green paint they were going to use on their back door. Okay? Right, wrong, or indifferent. Um, somebody said that that's 
it was a good rule. We want to control the quality because the people that live behind there are some bodies important and they didn't want to see an ugly green door on the back of the one of the people's house. Okay. So, and I, I can give you a hundred stories like that. But uh, an opinion is that the zoning people got too heavy handed. I'm a developer as an advocate, as a surveyor, as an engineer, as I developed my career, I like to have the developer do what they want to uh, an extent. Um, and one, uh, I, I, I've always kind of been a bulldog for the developer and kind of fight the zoning people. They don't like me a lot because I fight them. The reality is if I'm sitting here as an academic person teaching young people, there has to be a balance. Okay. It's like the politics in America. It's like you know, it's like here or here. And the reality is, in order to make anything work, it, marriages or relationships, anything, you gotta have some balance. Okay, you can't have one side that's too much this way, and I push back, and I'm really strong this way. I can do whatever I want. I okay, I'm going in whatever I want. That's not really good either. That interferes with the neighbors. And, no, I they get to tell me what to do. I mean, they don't want this brand new restaurant next to their you know, their little store. Well, too bad. So what? I don't know where at. At some point it comes together and has to be a balance. So um, long story short, there is a zoning department. We're going to anticipate zoning uh, for our restaurant. And they have a few things. And as your career develops, particularly if you go into land development, you'll, you'll know what I'm saying today. Okay, you'll, you'll, you'll hear that in learn more about it for our first semester second semester students doing this kind of stuff not as critical i just want you to know about it and you know, look for it but what we're going to do today there's a few things that the zoning department uh controls and that's the the use of the property is it going to be residential is it going to be uh commercial and then within the commercial, <clears throat> what kind of commercial? Is it going to be industrial stuff where you have factories? Is it going to be office buildings? Is it going to be uh, <coughs> is it going to is it going to allow stores and restaurants? Um, how big is the lot? Some of those kinds of things. So uh, one thing they control is the use. Second thing that they control then is uh, what's called setbacks and, and by setback i'm talking how far is it from the property line now that's not always the case they're not the only ones that have some significant say in the setback it's also a building code fire code issue <clears throat> which is an entirely different set of plans uh, agencies okay so fire code becomes important if you think back, maybe you've heard about the Great Chicago Fire. Okay, you had all these little wooden houses side by side in whatever year that was, 1890s or something. You had all these little houses side by side. Mrs. O'Leary's cow in the, in the barn kicks over the, the lantern, catches the hay on fire, building the barn catches fire, but since they're like this close to the neighbor, because you're allowed to do whatever you want, so the neighbor has a little wooden house and their house catches a fire and the next one and the next one and the next one to burn down 60% of Chicago. Okay. Um, some of those kinds of things are still together. This is a fire code issue. So today um, I could build on the property line in certain areas, but that wall has to be like a three hour rated concrete or concrete block wall or something that will not burn. And, propagate to the neighbor. Um, so fire codes become important. I can't have windows in there or very many or they have to be fire protected, et cetera. There's a lot of that kind of stuff we could talk about, but we're not. That's again, AE stuff uh, that gets into that world. <clears throat> this I'm talking about, about is a little bit more about the property and how close my neighbor can be to me with stuff. Um, and primarily, uh, where this comes into being is the other control element of the zoning department, and that's the parking. So for setbacks, you can like have a building so far off the street, so far off the side property line, but they're also going to control how much parking and how far and how close to the lot line. 
So if I put in a restaurant and I've only got three parking spaces, everybody's either going to park on the street if it's a good restaurant and really crowded, or nobody's going to show up to the restaurant because there's no place to park. Either everybody's going to park on the street and try to just stop and run in and get some really good food, <clears throat> or they're going to not go to that restaurant, which is is a culture kind of where we're at today. If I can't if I can't park by the door and go in and get a nice seat and a table, I'm probably going to find another nice restaurant which has that amenity. So again, as a developer on the developer side, um, my people, my clients want a lot of good parking and they want it near the door. They want an easy access. You don't want to disrupt your customers by making them park a long way and have to go through narrow aisles and such. So they also control how big. <clears throat> However, again, the developer, or excuse me, the zoning department has some <laughs> counterness to it. <clears throat> Got a neighbor who says all of this traffic from your really nice restaurant you know, I got cars pulling up to my property line and I hear noise and there's trash and there's lights at night and all of this kind of stuff. So they began to impose some sort of a setback to develop some green openness to it. Um, so they might have some setbacks primarily for their parking. How far from the property line can you be with the parking? Now, depending upon the use of the neighbor, it could be zero or it might be 10, 25 feet. It, it depends. <clears throat> Again, everything is sort of relative relative to these zoning um, areas. So for instance, if, if, if for, by chance there's a house existing and by chance I'm allowed to build a restaurant on the neighboring lot according to zoning, which occasionally happens, then the zoning department says, you can put it there, but your parking lot has to be 25 feet from their property lot, the rest of it grass and trees. And in some places, they even tell you how much, how many, what kind of trees. Hamilton County zoning, which is what we use and look at in lab today, uh, will tell you how many and what kind of trees and how often they're planted. That sounds great. That's a smiley face moment, right? Grass and trees and bunny rabbits and, and all of those kind of fun things. Two things. One, who maintains it? The owner of the restaurant. What if he doesn't maintain it? There are very little, very little zoning police people that will come out and give you a ticket. Yeah, they have some enforcing rules, but they're pretty busy. They're usually small departments. There's not a lot of development. There's not a lot of enforcement in 10 years from now, in five and 10 years from now. Like, hey, you're not meeting the zoning from 10 years ago. This doesn't happen. But you get a lot of trash, you get a lot of trees. Well, we'll make you put up a fence, and sometimes fences are more ugly than trees. It goes on and on. Okay, there, there's a million of those kinds of things. Um, the other thing is um, who enforces it, uh, but who maintains it? But on the other side, it's like, do you know how much I paid for this lot, and I can't use it? Okay, so this leads to a third thing that they control, or fourth, whatever much it is. And the one I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about today is called the impervious surface ratio. What? Let me slow down and talk about it. It's called the ISR, the impervious surface ratio. And most zoning departments have some form of this. Uh, again, not all. Little little subdivisions, or little cities like perhaps uh, Chevy or St. Bernard or something. They they may not have this. They simply have setbacks, which kind of does this. Um, but again, some of the bigger ones are going to come up with some creative ways to control how much you have. On your lot. So let's break this thing down to some impervious means water can't penetrate. If it's permeable, water can soak in. It's a fancy way of saying grass and trees, or in this case, impervious, would be saying like roofs and parking lots. 
roofs and parking lots. So an impervious surface is like a roof. It's like a parking lot. It's like a sidewalk. It's like some hardscape surface where water runs off of it because it doesn't soak into the ground. It's kind of like grass and trees, only they're designated in another little fancy term, impervious surface. And the ratio comes in um, by taking the, the area uh, of the roof, the area of the parking, the area of any hard surface, sidewalks, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Infrastructure, as it were, patios, something like that. Uh, primarily these three, roof, parking, and sidewalk. And taking that as a function of the total lot area. So ISR is the ratio of the area of the roof and the parking lot, sidewalks, patios, some of those things, to the total lot area. And by code, again, passed, legislated, somebody signed it, I don't know, um, like it, hate it, whatever. <clears throat> there are limits set, I'm going to give it a little squiggly line, means approximately. Um, there are limits set for each area. So if you are in a high density area, click the height up on McMillan. Calhoun, that kind of stuff. Pretty well developed. Those are going to be pretty high. Almost the entire lot is roof and parking lot. Right? As you get out to the suburbs, think about it. Okay, yeah. You did it, just put up this brand new Outback Steakhouse. But I remember there was a bunch of you know, parking areas that have like trees in the middle, islands, and there's some grass in the front, some gravel, a longhorns. They, you know, they kind of give you a little bit of greenery around it and you don't even necessarily know how much land they own behind there <clears throat> so the zoning department comes up with some sort of a ratio and says if you're going to do this you have to limit it and there's two numbers that kind of come up pretty regular around here Somewhere in the range of about 0 0.65, 0 0.75. So what this means is that my client buys a half a million dollar piece of property for one acre, or an acre and a half for half a million dollars. And when they put a restaurant on it or a store, the only two things that are important are the building and the parking. To my client. They want the building on there. That's their restaurant. They want uh, they want to have enough parking spaces so people can come into the restaurant. In fact, they want to have a fair number of parking spaces. Again, if I'm uh, somebody wants to go out to eat, great restaurant, they've only got five, 10, 20, 30 parking spots and they're all filled. They might have a huge restaurant, only a few number of parking spaces. They have no place to park. See, I'm going down the road. They're too busy. I'm leaving. I'm going someplace else. So my client likes to have lots of parking spaces, lots of parking. It's very premium. This is what sells. This is what they make their money. And then, of course, the building itself, how many people they can put in there, in that building. Look at this number. That's a percentage. That says that you can only put the things that are important and you can only use 65% of your land to do so. I think 100, 165, that's 35%. That's kind of like a tax. Now, it's not that you can't use it, but you can't use it for what makes you money. Again, I'm a developer's advocate. But keep that in mind. I'm fighting for the developer. I think that's I think that's crap. Personally, 
I think that's a 35% tax. And not only is it a one-time tax, they have to pay taxes on that restaurant every year, property taxes. And again, that, that money only comes from roof and parking. It doesn't come out of growing Christmas trees. So <clears throat> it raises the price of things. It, it complicates it. On occasion, if it gets into a little bit more dense area, sometimes it'll pay the zoning people. We'll let you go to 75%, but this usually requires some sort of a special board action. Often is what's called a planned unit development. Sometimes it's called a PUD. Uh, there's CUPs, there's community uh, urban development. There's all kinds of little fancy buzzwords. But <clears throat> this is usually a special um, a special blessing of the zoning department after there are certain hearings and meetings. <clears throat> now, I can see here uh, a little bit, public hearings, public meetings. <clears throat> so if I live in this neighborhood next to this planned whatever that they're gonna put in, this, this site that they're gonna develop, wants to be developed, um, I'm the neighbor, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna say, Heck yeah, let them put in whatever they want. Bring that, bring that park, bring that parking all the way to my line. No. I don't want them anywhere near me. I want to go over there and eat, but by golly, I don't want to have any of the, the negative connotation that goes along with it. I understand that. I really do. I, I like to have a nice quiet at home too. <clears throat> but if I'm running an office building next to this restaurant, what the crap is it my business? Again, personal opinion. Uh, whether they can, that, that owner can, wants to have more parking or not. Maybe if my parking lot fills up, they go over there. I don't know. Sometimes people get along. Sometimes they don't. But there will be hearings and meetings, and usually it takes 30, 60, 90, 120 days, six months, sometimes as much, um, to have these meetings. And depending on what you're trying to do or request, usually apartments are the worst because you have to, oh my gosh, now there's gonna be apartment buildings. Uh, people that live in them are not my kind of people. They they drive cars and there'll be more traffic. Like You drive a car, you make traffic too. And again, I'm a developer's advocate, so I'm kind of giving you only my side of the story. But yeah, there will be more traffic. There will be more noise. There'll be more kids running through your yard and all of those negative connotations. It, it's a balancing act. Where do you meet, okay? Mm -hmm. So good, bad, or indifferent, that I will leave that decision to you. I'm just telling you that that's kind of the reality uh, of what's going on. This impervious surface ratio is important in, in being able to come up with a, uh, a percentage of it. Now, there's one other thing on the next piece of paper. Um, And I will show you this in the county zoning code today because of the cameras and the action. I can't just bring this up, but it's not that big of a deal. I can take a little sketch of it. <clears throat> but there's one other thing that the zoning department really uh, controls again and in the parking in the area of parking, and that's the size of the parking lot uh, spaces. So in the, uh, in the code books, again, probably everyone I've ever seen, it will have a definition as to what a permissible parking space is. And again, as a developer's advocate, we want something that is useful, but not something that is wasteful. We wanna get as many legitimate parking spaces in there as possible, but they have to be reasonable. So let me just kind of give you the short story here. Um, depending upon which way you have like a Kroger's or some of the big box stores will often have like an up aisle with angled parking and a down angle. You know. The reality is those don't work. The, the donkeys always drive the wrong way and then you gotta try to get into the spot. So what we do almost all the time, rare that I, do anything but this. We do what's called 90 degree parking. And there's a space between where you back out and the people across the aisle from you. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> and the length and the width of the parking space and the distance between them, the aisle space, is a regulated zoning code thing, regulated zoning code rule. So the one that we are using, the Hamilton County zoning, is pretty similar to most zoning codes in the U.S., certainly in this region. So what they're going to tell me is that I have to have a minimum of a 9 by 19 space, minimal 9 feet wide, 19 long space. And in order to have two-way traffic so that cars can come from both directions and pull in and somebody can back out and go you know, either direction that you want to go, um, they will tell you that that aisle width has to be 24 feet. All right, now again, this affects the impervious surface ratio because the bigger the parking spots, the more impervious area you got. And they tell me I have to have a number of how many parking spaces I have to have. So I, I've got this conflict. Now, unfortunately, the people at home don't get to see me do this, but well, maybe I'll walk in front of this little screen here. I'll start right about here. And we go. 19 feet. We call this, we call this zero right here. Now, I know how to pace a little bit. My pace is about uh, three feet, roughly. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, and one more is nineteen. So from here to there, do you think you can get your car into that space? I think you get a pretty good sized pickup truck into that space, couldn't I? Plus the horses behind it, right? You know what I mean? I'm done, I can put a bus in there. That's a big space. And I did that a number of years ago at the zoning department because I said, look, you, you, you don't want me to have a lot of impervious surface ratio, but you make this stupid thing 19 feet long. It's dumb. They don't like it when I say that stuff. Because I apply the care down. And they don't like that. Now, nine feet, not bad. Nine foot's actually fairly narrow because you got some of these two two door sports cars. Two door sports cars, they open up and they start hitting the neighbor. All right, get clink. Clink. Let's face it, people in America are a little bit larger than they used to be. They need to open the door a little bit farther than they used to open it. And, you know, if I got a car parked, you know, close by, and this guy wants to try to get out, so he gives himself a little bit more space so he can open his car, but he clinks this door. I come out of a restaurant enough and I got dings on the side of my car, I'm not happy. Not, might not go back to that restaurant. So while nine's not a bad number, 10's a better number, but if I go to 10, I don't get to make 19, stupid 19 any shorter, and there's conflict. So just the kind of stuff that I argue, I try to tell my students, I want you to be, I want you to be well informed, and I want you to have an opinion, and I want you to state it with good reason. And some of these will be standing before zoning codes or whatever. Point out the obvious. Where I want to educate a bunch of people to do. Okay. You can have an opinion. I, I appreciate that. I want you to have one. Have an informed decision and point out the obvious. That's kind of the George effect, right? I want you to do that. Be somewhat spunky. I like spunky students. That aside, they tell me that I'm allowed to have a 10 foot. But then it's 10 by 19, and now I'm adding another, I don't know, 19 square feet to that parking spot. Blah, 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 blah. It goes on and on and on. So, um, for today, for this project, we will live with what the code tells us. Parking spaces will be 9 by 19 with a 24 foot aisle. All right, the very last thing here is that <clears throat> I 
there is going to be a code requirement that tells me how many parking spaces I need, how many parking spaces I need. Based upon the size of the building, there will be a table of um, required parking spots. And sometimes it's very loose. If it's a commercial, you need one for 100 square feet, one for 200 square feet. Sometimes it's like that. Or if it's sort of generic, like a shopping mall, you may not know what's going to be in every store. But think about this. Medical offices require a lot more parking space. People are there, they're there for a long time, they're waiting, there's an in, there's an out, they got doctors by five offices, you know, they're trying to hit each one, and you got a parking space, parking space, there's a lot more requirements for parking for uh, an office building, or for a medical office, than for, let's say, you know, a state farm insurance office. And somebody pulls up, they go in and get their insurance, they pay it, they come back out. So the number of parking spaces is based upon the use, and sometimes it's just generic, like one for 200 square feet of building. But sometimes it's very, very specific, like a medical use. If you're gonna have that, you're gonna have a restaurant. That's a very specific use. You're gonna have, I don't know, a drive-through restaurant. Now I got the restaurant, but I also have to have enough spaces for the five, six, seven, eight cars. It's gonna back up. Think about Chick-fil-A. Oh my gosh, you need 400 backup spaces, right? You gotta wrap around three times like a spiral. So sometimes it gets to be very specific and sometimes it's a little bit more generic, but it is based upon the use. I will tell you that for our lab that we are working on, we're going to start our design of our restaurant. It is one space per 100 square feet of restaurant and they will have the word net in there. What the heck is a net? Well, that's what you catch the fish in. Okay, so what this means is that I need one parking, I, I, I need at least one parking space for every 100 square feet of restaurant size. One parking space for every 100 square feet of parking uh, of uh, restaurant size. But they use the word net. And what the word net is, is a little ambiguous. You can argue with, I think it's been tried, they tried to codify it code, put it in code a few years ago, but um, <clears throat> in general, you can take out the restaurant, the, uh, the restroom spaces. You're either at your table or you're in the restroom, but probably both of them are going to be occupied at the same time. Um, the storage areas where they store the food or the tablecloths or whatever you store. If, Kitchenware. Nobody's like using that space as a restaurant, you know, as a sit down table space. So usually take that up. Hallways, again, not, not going to be occupied. Anything that's not continuously occupied or really part of it can be removed out. Okay. Um, in general, rest, uh, restrooms, hallways, um, not the foyer. Foyer's kind of dense, right? Everybody's trying to wait to get to their seat. It's more busy there. You got a lot of people in there. So sometimes, again, there's some somewhat of a balance. The kitchen area, it's not one for 100, but you got a lot of stuff and people come in. Sometimes you can reduce that area down. Again, this is this is kind of a, an art as much as it is a science, um, what the word net means. And people argue that uh, based upon the floor plan of the actual building that's going in. So at the beginning, you don't always know that. We, the civils, who are designing this site, we don't really know what that is necessarily. We don't know how much restroom space or hallways there's going to be. So we use the rule of George, and it's about 85%. <clears throat> Again, that's just kind of a rough thing based upon my experience through many, many years. And I, I push the envelope. It's probably a little bit closer to 90, but who cares? 85 works better. So, and there's really not a great deal of argument because my clients want parking spaces anyway. So they're not too upset how much I net out. They might take the whole 100% of it and get more parking spaces. They don't care. But this is a minimum number uh, that the zoning folks say you have to have, the minimum number of parking spaces. So in lab today, in a little bit, we are going to have a 10,000 square foot 
restaurant. So in lab today, we're going to have a 10,000 square foot restaurant. We're going to start designing it. Or Thursday, if you're in Thursday's lab, um, we're going to start to design that. <clears throat> and if we take 85% of that, that's not a real fancy computation there. It's 8,500 square feet, or 8,500 net square feet. And we divide that by one per 100 is our parking spaces. And lo and behold, our design comes out to be 85 parking spaces. That are a minimum of nine by 19 in a 24 foot aisle. Okay. It's fuzzy, but we talk about it. So for our design, for your design, this is what you get to work with. These are your rules of engagement. This is the rules that you get. So last week we drew the property lines up. We know what property is. We know how big we own to put this thing on. Do we have to have any setbacks or parking? Yes, we're going to have, and I don't love it, but it's what it is. We're going to have a 10 foot green strip. on the parking side of the property line. So if we have a property line, we're gonna have a 10 foot green strip and we'll put some trees and bunny rabbits over there. Make the zone go happy. So that's gonna be what we got. Now on the right of way side, they probably would have the same requirement. Again, they don't like you to park right on the right of way line. And the right of way, if you recall, was basically the property line of the street, as it were. But we'll have the same 10 foot green strip over there. <clears throat> and we will have the same 65% ISR. Now, what I'm going to have you do, um, maybe even yet today, after you get your building and your parking on there, uh, I'm going to have you compute that. And it'll be, in this case, it should be quite a bit less. I, I, I didn't push the envelope to try to make it as big as possible. So your, your ISRs will probably come in at about 40% or something like that. So you can plenty of, plenty of space. In fact, I don't even care what it is. I just want you to compute it for me and have it available. We'll put that on the drawing at some point in time before we turn them in. All right. But I do want you to understand what ISR is in terms of surface ratio and how to compute it. So we'll use the area command today and AutoCAD okay Thursday to, uh, to do that. So um, for a snowy day, it's 908, that's not too bad. Um, I think that's as much as I want to teach you uh, this morning. So um, I'm going to head over, I'm going to get my free cup of coffee and then head over to Edwards. I got an umbrella hat, gloves, mittens, over there. I'll be over there about 9.30ish. Um, and then um, Thursday morning, we'll be back here. If you are here today, you put your little signature on this little sign today. I have to say, get a few holders to the best little smiley face for you all. That's the best smiley face of anybody. Thank you for your attendance today.